Welcome to Renegade Inc. There's nothing like the idea of a unionised worker to make the predatory capitalist convulse. For them, precarious employment is profitable. But what if this subjugation and short-termism has had its time? As younger generations of workers increasingly see the benefits of a trade union, is the tide turning on those companies who have long exploited workers to swell their bottom line? Carolyn Jones, welcome to Renegade Inc. Lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. Carolyn, you are the uh, one of the, the director of the Institute of Employment Rights. Um, why does that organisation exist? Surely in 2021, we're all enlightened enough to know that you've got to look after workers, you've got to pay them well. Unions are a, a good thing because they uh, keep people together. You have a collective voice. That means that those people can spend into the economy. Surely your organisation should be obsolete by now. I agree. Uh, one would think that in the sixth richest nation in the world, um, that is allegedly the most democratic and allegedly gold plates all our employment rights, that there would be no reason for the Institute of Employment Rights. I wish that were true, but unfortunately it isn't. In the UK, we are a fine example of how a body like ours that argues for employment rights and trade union freedoms is needed because too many people are struggling uh, this pandemic has exposed a lot of it. So um, we've got one million workers on zero hour contracts. We've got over eight million people working in households that live in poverty. We've got 60% of people in households where at least one person works and they're still using food banks. Average wages have not been raised in real terms for over 12 years. There are so many examples I could give of why unfortunately the institute of employment rights is still needed we were born out of thatcher um when she introduced step after step eight pieces of legislation were introduced by margaret thatcher and her government to curtail the rights of trade unions and as we all know if you don't have free trade unions operating effectively in the workplace then the imbalance in power means that bad employers are allowed to set the pace. It breeds bad practices like the fire and rehire tactics that we've seen so much of during this pandemic period. So I wish we could close shop and go, but unfortunately, until our employment standards are raised, then the, the work of the Institute of Employment Rights will continue. Is it not the case that Thatcher was so driven ideologically that uh, once she had something in the crosshairs, she'd pursue it uh, without any reason or rationale. And just to make uh, a comparison, if you go across to Germany, the Germans and the German governments over the years have realized that a healthy trade union movement is actually a good thing insofar as if trade unions and their workers have spending power, a, a, a section of the economy will remain vibrant because people can pay into that uh, sector of the economy and, and uh, ultimately, economically, overall, that's a good thing. If you smash people uh, in the way Thatcher did and subsequent ideologues have, if you smash unions and smash people and don't give them uh, uh, that spending power, this is what happens, isn't it? Which is inequality goes through the roof uh, and all the negative side effects that come with that. Are you fighting to say, actually, we've got to revisit this ideology? Absolutely. I think you must have been reading our publications and jamming up on our way because that's exactly the argument that we make. And of course, when we travel around Europe, lawyers, academics, trade unionists find it very difficult to understand the system that guides the uh, industrial relations system in the UK. In the UK, we particularly have a low pay economy because following the Thatcher years and following attacks on trade unions, we now face the situation where, what is it, seven in nine people find their employment rights imposed by their employer rather than through negotiation by a trade union. We all know that where a union exists, uh, pay is higher, health and safety is better, equality is better, pensions are better. And in the UK, the figure stands at a pay increase of around 8%. You put 8% more money in workers' pockets and they go out and buy goods. That pr provides jobs for other people. That then stimulates the economy all the more. It's a win-win situation. And the way you get that is by 
allowing trade unions to negotiate in the workplace. This isn't something that just we argue for. The OECD have argued for it. The International Labour Organization have argued for it. Even the IMF researchers are now saying that the best way to raise people out of poverty and to stimulate the economy is by collective bargaining with trade unions. It's just win-win. Do you think that workers now uh, are going to organise uh, again uh, and uh, create unions because of the new political landscape that we find ourselves in. Uh, and maybe a canary in the wine for that is the Super League. So suddenly you had these billionaire owners from all over the world. And I know that it isn't unionised footballers or unionised fans, but you can see the parallels. You've got these billionaire owners from all over the uh, globalists all over the planet. And suddenly uh, football was so... Uh, um, vital to these fans, they stood up and said, no, enough is enough. Can you see a sort of uh, a parallel, if you like, between fans saying no enough to the plutocrats and workers saying no enough to the exploitative capitalists? I think that's a very good example. And it shows the power of the collective and it shows the power of, you know, feet on the ground, going out and complaining about how it's won. You know, that's Super League football. It's supposed to be, they say it's run by the free market that, you know, people (laughs) decide when they're, well, there's an, and, and, it's not free market. It's 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 monopoly. It's monopoly situation. It is the wealthy taking over the small. It is removing competition because where's the competition in the Super League? You can try as hard as you can, but you're not going to be raised up. You're where you are because it's predetermined by money and by a Super Six. Now there are a lot of examples. We would like to see that happen more and more in terms of workplace rights. The only thing that frustrates me a little bit about the football thing is, you know, we've been arguing against uh, precarious work and exploitation and zero hour contracts for a good few years. And then a Super League gets presented and people are out on the streets. I wonder what it's going to take for people to realise and join the dots together to see that what's happening in their workplace isn't natural isn't you know the free market just happening this is a political decision and based on political attacks on a political economic ideology that is determined how our workplaces is run and when people see that bigger picture one would hope that they would say no power is in our hands we are the ones that create the wealth in this country, in fact, around the world. And we are the ones who want a seat at the table that decides how the workplace is run, how our sector is run, and how our economy is run. And I think until you get that, until you get the voice of workers uh, embedded into the political and economic system, then we're going to carry on with exploitation, super exploitation, and a downward spiral in terms of employment rights. Penultimately, uh, not all things union uh, are wonderful. There is that militant aspect to them. How do you um, ensure that unions remain reasonable and they don't you know, take advantage of that, their position in the way that they have done in the past? Because a lot of people watching this will say, yeah, all well and good, Carolyn, but actually I've been on the receiving end of militant action. It hasn't been fun. Yes, well, I mean, my argument to that would be uh, trade unions are the largest, most democratic organisations in this country. They're far more democratic than uh, governments. They have got far more regulations controlling how they operate than companies. The level of regulation and employment law restricting trade unions has now reached a point i think where most people accept that the balance of power has strung against unions what we find when we um take surveys is that unions are very popular and they're growing in popularity in the uk and if you talk to young people who don't have that myths of you know winter discontent and all that in their memory then they just see unions as good In fact, the pandemic has highlighted that because more and more people see unions as being the only ones who would save them during the pandemic. So, for instance, when the NEU, when education unions call people out to say we're not going back to work, people did it. They don't see unions as being overpowering, overbearing or undemocratic. I think they see them as being necessary in our society to bring a level, a rebalancing of power in the workplace. 
power has swung far too much in favour of the employers. Let's finish then with a bit of context, because um, these younger people coming through, whether they're millennials or however you want to, whichever sort of glib branding you want to give these um, social groups, when you look across Europe and you see uh, really good uh, workers' conditions, good holiday pay, uh, good uh, better levels of pay, uh, less precariousness when it comes to, to contracts, etc., when young people see that, that becomes the threat of a good example, doesn't it? Because they think, well, if they're doing it in Spain, if they're doing it in France, they're doing it in Germany, they're doing it in the Netherlands, why aren't we doing it? So suddenly it becomes less about the winter of discontent, wildcat strikes and all that militant stuff, and it becomes about, well, hang on, they're doing it, we want that too. Is that uh, awakening starting to happen when we look across to Europe? I think so, yeah. I think people are, well, we tell them it all the time. Workers in the UK work the longest hours for the lowest pay, for the shortest holidays, retire the latest, have the lowest pension than workers throughout Europe. Why is that? Why, why is that? You know, we are the sixth richest nation in the world, and yet we are paying some of the lowest wages in terms of how other people are operating throughout Europe. So I think people do, in that sense, put the dots together and say, we know another way is possible. So they look, for instance, at uh, working time and the hours that other workers do throughout Europe, far better working hours than we have. They have a better social security safety net than we have here. The, the, the answers are there for people to see. Uh, if people are listening to this and light bulbs are, are going on and people are saying, hey, uh, Carolyn's talking a lot of common sense here, what can they do? What can the uh, average worker do to say, no, I do want to unionise, I do want to organise and I do want my voice heard because I've had enough of being exploited? Well, there's a couple of things we can do immediately. One is they have to join a trade union because the more people who join a trade union, the more people who vote for trade unions in the workplaces, the better access unions will get to workplaces and the more they'll be able to represent the interests of workers. So joining a union and supporting that union in the workplace um, is very important. The second point is that people need to vote. Let your feelings be felt about where you think politics are going at the moment and let their political response be heard. Carolyn Jones, Director at the Institute of Employment Rights, thank you very much for your time. Nice to be here, thank you. Carolyn Steinhoff, welcome to Renegade Inc. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Carolyn, uh, very few people in the UK really know uh, what's happening in the US when it comes to uh, workers organising and unionising. Uh, but what we are aware of is that whenever workers' rights are talked about or workers' conditions, there's a certain company that comes up with monotonous regularity talking about how workers are uh, mistreated uh, or, uh, let's say, compromised when it comes to working conditions. Um, just talk to us about Amazon, the business, and how the recent efforts of workers in the US to unionize, uh, so to uh, push back against what they see to be, uh, let's say, unfair or arguably predatory working conditions. Amazon, I think people feel like it's uh, a new phenomenon because it's so cutting edge and you know they have this web service and they're so techn technology oriented. And those are innovative things, but in fact, you know, really Amazon is is just like companies. I think it was Natasha Leonard, the journalist, called it the East India Company of today. You know, <laughs> where they really operate in a, the same kind of way that, um, like Dickens wrote about, this mentality of of pure greed and seeking a profit at all costs and even delight in dominating and, and oppressing um, others. It's a kind of feeling of power, I feel. But uh, when you talk about unions in the US of A, it's a total anathema, is it not? Because, well, since inception, it's in your DNA to be uh, rampant capitalists, to be laissez-faire with regulation, to be Anne Randian, if you like. Because um, Alan Greenspan, no less, says uh, that the optimum state for workers is to be neurotic, marginalised, insecure, precarious, because, and at least he was honest about this, that is the easiest way you can control them. So how do you begin to change that with a union? 
one of the big components of that way of, of working that you're just describing, I feel, is the internalization of by workers, by working people, of the belief that just what Alan Greenspan says. Are you saying that Amazon workers internalize failure uh, blaming themselves instead of the structure that they're working Absolutely. with. Absolutely. This is the explicit um, sort of rep repeated mantra that we hear. You can hear in many different spokespeople, Amazon, anytime I've seen interviews with them, they say this kind of thing. Uh, you know, it's a demanding job. I, this is almost their, they have lines, you know, that they've memorized and they say these in a very calm and professional, you know, uh, civil kind of tone, you know, um, well, yes, it's a very demanding job. And if people can't do it, then it's probably not the job for them. The new employee always comes in. This is the story when you hear them over and over. You know, I've heard this, it's a pattern where they say, when I first started, I loved the company. I thought it was great. They welcomed me, you know, they told me all these benefits I would have. They told me I would be able to advance and, and they're paying me, you know, 15 an hour and it's really I feel great you know and the warehouse is incredible look at this huge you know place with all this technology and then they get to a point over not that long several months a year maybe two years that you know after a point they start to just be horrified and 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 realize that none of the things they were promised are coming true they're not getting any of the benefits as soon as they have any kind of like they're ill family members ill um there's a crisis uh someone falls you know out with covid next to them standing shoulder to shoulder and they don't do it they go and try to report it and they can't do it and they're they're told well if you don't like it you know you can always leave so my name is Cassandra. Um, I work at one of the call centers for Amazon in Phoenix, Arizona. Um, I've been with Amazon since I believe May 2017. I know it'll be my um, fourth year on May 27th with Amazon. My issues have stemmed around accommodation and accessibility for being disabled at Amazon and their lack of accommodation. Amazon is rather notorious for not accommodating people, but they've particularly dragged my case out for well over a year at this point, because I first applied in October 2019 for accommodation. And what ended up happening is my caseworker ghosted me, like would not communicate with me, would not send out the paperwork. By the time I got the paperwork, the appointments I could get for my doctor were in April 2020. You know, what happened between October 2019 and, uh, April 2020, pandemic. When I called the Employee Resource Center, which is how you kind of set up everything at Amazon, how you get a hold of HR, how you get a hold of caseworkers for accommodation, how you get set up for um, you know, like family medical leave and all of that. Um, but because they outsource their Employee Resource Center to Cairo and Cebu, uh, they're not really trained and they only make about $4 an hour. So what ended up happening was I called and they told me I should have called sooner and that I would have to contact my old caseworker who I couldn't get a hold of, or I'd have to contact HR. And HR is kind of notorious for leaving your tickets open for a month and then just closing them without solving anything. Basically, by the time I got it submitted, I was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. When I did have a healthy event at work, like my heart rate would shoot up to 170 and then drop down to 50 beats per minute, kind of feeling like you're going back and forth between a heart attack and cardiac arrest. Um, what would end up happening is I would have a panic attack and I wouldn't respond very well to people talking to me when this happened. And I would get written up for behavioral issues, even though I was telling them that my heart rate was doing wonky things, skyrocketing and plummeting. They went out of their way to prevent me from even getting the accommodation paperwork put in. And they would also write me up and do like performance plans every time I'd have a health related instance at work, um, including one instance where I started breaking out full body hives because they had hazelnuts in the office. 
which I'm really, really allergic to. And the OM said, even if I was going into anaphylaxis, he would not help me because, you know, EpiPens and Benadryl are drugs and you can't do drugs at work. But I'm more than welcome to leave and get a occurrence or write up for leaving work early, or I could stay and tough it out. My name is Connor. Uh, I am a former Amazon employee. I was uh, hired by the company in August of 2017 uh, at one of the fulfillment centers in New Jersey. Uh, and then I was terminated in um, November of 2019. So I worked for the company for almost three years. Um, and uh, my termination involved uh, at the time I had a family member who was sick and I had to leave work to help take care of them. Um, however, at the time it wasn't a blood related family member. So Amazon's leave policy didn't uh, cover that. It only covers if you have a family member who's related by blood. Um, however, I spoke with uh, my HR representatives at the site and they said um, they would approve a personal leave. And um, I, left the, I left work for a few days I was later informed by the company that uh, due to the fact that I would be leaving during the peak season, uh, they'd be unable to approve my leave and uh, I'd miss too many days of work. So they'd be firing me for a job abandonment. Um, and during this whole process, I had to go back and forth with different teams in Amazon who were contradicting themselves. And I noted that uh, during the whole time, there was nobody in the company who um, their job was to act as kind of an employee advocate. Um, every HR representative, every team member I spoke to, their job was to um, minimize liability for the company. So there was nobody who was concerned with helping me keep my job. And it was at that time I realized that uh, if Amazon had been unionized, at the very least, I would have somebody whose job it is to hear my side of the story and possibly help me keep my job during this situation. There's actually in the paperwork you sign when you get hired a part about unions stating that they would prefer you not to unionize and it goes against amazon culture to unionize they really do expect you to sacrifice your life for subsidizing the amazon dream if they see that you're a problem in any way whether you're asking for accommodation or you're pointing out the illegal behaviors that they are doing or you're trying to even talk about unionization um, they will isolate you and get rid of you so fast. What are the tactics that Amazon have used to prevent unions uh, coming into existence? In Bessemer, Alabama, they had uh, repeated multiple times a day, hour long or more than hour long meetings, mandatory meetings for workers to uh, hear talks by anti-union uh, professionals telling them why a union was uh, that, that they should they would have to pay dues, telling them that they would have to go on strike right away as soon as the union was voted in, voted in, even if they didn't want to, they would lose their pay, they could get fired, um, that they, they didn't need the union because they have a wonderful direct relationship. Um, they put stickers and, and posters around the facility, including in the inside of the bathroom door stall, the stall doors, um, out, you know, laying out all the reasons why unions were, were bad. Um, they, people were harassed by uh, management. They have a whole training for management, which you can find. We see the video that they show training management how to talk to workers to discourage them. They have, uh, they, they perceive any kind of union organizing or sentiment in a worker, they immediately begin, have the management is required to tell them, you know, that they shouldn't do it. They had a mailbox outside the facility that to mail your ballot to imply that they could surveil you if you did put your ballot into the box. It's all very Kafkaesque this, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. They're, they're amazingly brilliant at this kind of roundabout, circuitous, never overt tactics at every turn in every way. Um, the policies for the workers where they, they officially have these fairly liberal policies, but then if the workers try to cash in at any point on sick leave or time off, they're sent through a run around, an incredibly elaborate run around to the point where they're then fired for not for violating some little rule that just got made up right at that moment, you know. 
Um, and the anti-union efforts, the union busting was exactly like that also, yes. Very insidious, very um, never overt. How do you begin to speak to management, though, and say, actually, uh, you know, this ideological drive that you've got and we have in the UK that everything to do with unions is bad. How do you speak to management and say to them, listen, actually, people organising and being in a union, it means that their well-being starts to go up. It means that they can demand better pay. It means that their families are looked after in a better way. It means holistically we can really look after workers and actually they can come to the table and negotiate and then feel satisfied that they've got a good deal and go away. And then we can run a happier ship. When I listen to you saying that, I'm trying to listen from the perspective of an Amazon, uh, you know, like Bezos. Um, I'm hearing what you're saying from their point of view and all of that is like, Exactly. That's why we need the union busters now, <laughs> because everything you said is what they do not want. Do not. That's the anathema. That's their nightmare right there. So it's really about leveraging power. We just work the only way. That's why the union is essential. And it's the only way for workers to change the story, the picture, the situation, because in this extreme version of capitalism, with this incredibly powerful dominant force from the top, you know, and this helpless, uh, desperate workers barely surviving, we have to, it's about power. And the only power we have is in solidarity. But I believe what that solidarity is about more than anything is changing the stopping, not continuing to have that internalized acceptance of you know, myself as a worker deserving this in some way. Carolyn Steinhoff, thank you very much for your time. Thank you so much.